to my way of building, these are the these are the four things that I'm looking for in guitar. A good string to string and note to note balance. Can you achieve that by getting a lot of resonant frequencies? Clarity. Clarity is more important than decibels. Clarity is strong fundamentals. But it's important to have sufficient presence. Presence comes when you have these harmonic structures are filled in for every note. And an appealing character. What that means is the guitar sounds like what it's supposed to sound like. Brazilian rosewood dreadnought, you know, or a mahogany parlor guitar. So, to create a piano-like tone, we always talk about, you know, wanting this guitar has a wonderful piano-like tone. That's kind of what we're after. Top stiffness must be, must balance with the string load. Different strings place different loads on different tops. If your top is too stiff, like a cinder block, it's not going to vibrate efficiently. The strings will not efficiently drive a cinder block, nor will they drive a top that's too light. And the symbol in the middle is a braced X-braced Martin guitar top, which is, as it turns out, is a very nice happy medium. Sort of like somewhere in that middle zone is where we're shooting for. Um, mandolin makers actually measure top deflection. There's three or four guys out, I have four photos here. I only just picked one of them, but just a simple system, you put a weight on a on a thing that presses down on the bridge and you measure the deflection. So, you know, great efficiency in transferring string oscillation to top oscillation has to do with building to a certain stiffness within a certain range. And at that stiffness, you want to have a lot of resonant frequencies. <laughs> On my iPhone, I have a few harmonic analyzation uh, apps. Harmonic Analyzer is this one. It's pretty cool. Um, I set the, there's a, there's a bunch of settings here, but basically that top line is the highest peak. Okay, so when you're putting an input into it, it records the highest peaks. So I'm just playing a finished guitar and playing and playing until the peaks stop growing. That basically tells you what's kind of what's coming out. Um, the two red lines are the range of the guitar defined by the lowest note and the highest note on the fingerboard, and everything above that is overtone. This is a good guitar. This, you know, and I. I I picked it because it was a good guitar. <coughs> it has a lot of peaks, as you can see, but there really aren't that many. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe, in the range of the guitar. But what's important is that you don't have really deep valleys, or too many of them, because some note may fall, say, on the side of that peak, but that's still pretty high, too, OK? The, the signal for that is, is just just a pure tone, or is it? It's me playing the guitar, <coughs> just sitting there and playing a couple of tunes, making sure that I get all the way up and down the fretboard, you know, playing, trying to play loud, and this low signal down here is the background noise. Oh, so that measures a bunch of different samples. Yeah, and okay. as I play, if I play a note that hasn't been sampled before and hasn't been sampled that loudly, it's going to push the peaks up. And the peaks keep growing until pretty much until they stop. And then I can take a, a screenshot. Your tap tone should be complex, pleasing, and musical. What does this mean? I once went to a, um, a lecture given by a guy who made steel drums. And he talked about a method of tuning his facets to, I think he called them triple tuning, and um, he, was get, he, he wanted to get three harmonics, a fundamental and two other harmonics from, from each note, from each facet. 
and, and, the, and the drums didn't sound, you know, like clanky and whatever, his steel drums sounded musical. And he said he learned everything from marimba makers. So I started looking into marimba makers, and as it turns out, they tune a bar of wood to get three harmonics. It's called triple tuning. Um, you know, the various areas, if you, you know, the center of the, the, the scoop will tune the, the, the fundamental and on and on, the edges of the scoop. And if you go too far, you can even trim the edge of the, harm, of the, edge of the key and then raise the pitch again. You know, as you, as you remove wood, and, and you're going to make, you're gonna make the, pitch, the fundamental pitch go down, but if you're, if you, can, you can bring it back up by removing some more wood in a different place. And I got to thinking, when I was looking at this thing, those marimba bars remind me of something. Look at that brace. That's a marimba bar. So, how is it actually done? These are the tools that I use in general demonstrate in a moment. Five stages of voicing. I think this is the top. There are no braces that go this way. So the stiffness of your top in this direction depends on the actual thicknessing of the top. Okay, we've got braces going this way. We've got an X brace above taking care of things, but what's ever happening down here is mostly held up by the thickness of the top. So we thickness all of our tops by how flexible they are as they come off the sander. How flexible they are in this direction, along the grain. We thickness the back for optimal weight and responsiveness. Super heavy back is going to put a drag on your tone if it's coca bolo or macassar ebony or you know one of those woods that's going to be quite a bit thinner than if it's mahogany. And you can. As you tap a cutout top or back, this, it's, this has braces on it now, so it doesn't quite tap in the same way. You can hear the resonance as you kind of get to the optimal stiffness. And we shape the back braces, tapping, so I can get four good marimba bar notes. And then we um, shape the top braces by the method that I'm going to talk about in a moment. And after the body's put together, you still have an ability to graduate the top either selectively in one area or around the edges or and the back. There's a few things you can do. You know, as a builder, you always want to not go too far. You, want, you always want to you always want to err on the side of um, you know keeping it a little on the heavy side, at least until the last possible moment. So, step by step, stay, uh, shaping top braces. We, um, we machine our braces before gluing them down, and there's just junk that has to be removed, <laughs> you know, before you can even start. So, the, you're just taking away any unintended material, whatever's hanging over, or, you know, trimming this patch here, or smoothing. You know this curve out here, kind of getting it into a zone that I would call the starting place. Number two, you take a look at your mortised brace ends. My uh, my transverse brace is very stout, and, it, and they sit on pillars, and I just don't want that brace to move at all. I don't really; it doesn't have much to do with the resonance of the rest of the top, at least according you know, to my way of building. Uh, the edges of the braces could be stout or they could be super thin. It kind of depends. You know, we, have, we have a range that we started in on, but sometimes it's a little thick because you know, the wood is a little flexible, more flexible than others. But you have to determine that kind of at the beginning as opposed to later on. Then we play around with the cross section of the brace. I love this illustration because these three braces 
are able, to, these three cross sections are able to carry the same load. Remember that I said that you know, your top, the, ov the overall top has to carry your, your string load, whatever that is, whether it's a long scale, short scale, whether it's a wide span or a short span. Um, the triangular cross section is 28% lighter in weight than the rectangular section. So, you know, you have most people have a parabola kind of brace, but you have quite a bit of control over that weight and that mass and tuning by the by the way you shape your cross section of your X brace. Here's a good example. This X brace starts out relatively square and ends up, it's not quite a triangle, but it's more like a, a trapezoid. They carry about the same amount of weight. You can, you know, depending on how, how far you scoop the bottom. Then we adjust the perimeter stiffness. You can see two different, sometimes Sometimes your, your top wood goes a little bit off the quarter out here, and it's much more flexible than it is down the middle. And in a flexible top, you want to have a shorter scoop than in a very stiff top. So as you're playing around with your perimeter stiffness, whatever stiffness you decide you want that to be, it's adjustable by you know, the ends of your braces. Um, I like to balance the stiffness across and along the grain evenly. This way and this way. The stiffness along the grain is mostly controlled by the top thickness and the heights of the X braces. Stiffness across the grain is controlled by the inside scoop of the finger braces and the inside scoop of the tone bar. These are the finger braces, and as you can see, that inside scoop is quite a bit stouter than that. And these are your tone bars here. So by adjusting these inside scoops, quite, you can feel the difference. You can feel this lighten up. This is going to be what it is. It's, going to, it's not going to change from how, how thick that top started out, but this is very adjustable. So most of my voicing kind of gets done in that very last stage. Voicing is complete when top achieves desired stiffness along and across the grain. Might be different for your style of building than for mine. I kind of know where I want mine to be. You got to decide that. Do you measure that, or you just do that by feel? I do it by feel. Okay. And it, but it can be measured. Sure, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the top achieves the desired stiffness at the edges. Think about it. Your floor, the floor, it's, it's braced. If it's braced a little light, it's going to be bouncy in the middle. You get out toward the edge, and it can be very stiff. A very stiff floor is going to be stiffest at the edges. So you want to, you know, you want to concentrate on your edges. Frequency distribution is optimized for your tone wood selection and body style, and a majority of tap tones is strong, clear, and musical. Okay, five related steps. You flex the top, you tap to evaluate, you do some brace shaping, then you reevaluate, and then you repeat until you kind of get there. You're working your way. To, to your final result. When you get there, there's a bunch of, when you get close, there's a bunch of different things you can do, but you're trying to get more, as many clear notes as you can. I'm gonna demonstrate that in a sec. A couple things to avoid, out of phase waveforms. You're gonna get a few places where you tap and you can get the same note. If they're out of phase, what do they do? They cancel. Change one of them when you do what happens. You get two notes. You go from zero to two. So that's a lot. Lots of times, voicing away, and all of a sudden, 
way this just comes alive. A little couple, a little, that's what's happening, I think, in a lot of those cases. The other thing to avoid is beating waveforms. A mandolin, out of tune, has some nasty sound, right? The, anal the analogous thing going on in the top is a couple of notes that are close and beating. So when it, sometimes you tap in and holding, when you're hearing something nasty, you gotta move one of those notes. If you can move one of those notes, all of a sudden you get two nice notes. 